Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for being here. My guest this episode is the strange traveler himself, Mr. Michael Huntington. Michael has a blog called Huntington Strange Travels, as well as a robust social media presence where he documents his family's journeys to places of high strangeness across the United States. Michael and I got off on the right foot by expressing our mutual admiration for the old Hardy Boys books, and then we discussed the Cape Girardeau, Missouri UFO incident and its similarity to Roswell, the Jacques Vallée approach to UFO phenomena, cryptid sightings and theories, Michael's trip to the real exorcist house, and his upcoming trip during the Great American Eclipse to the site of the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblin Encounter. It's folklore galore, much fun was had, I enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you do too. So here it is, my conversation with Michael Huntington. Enjoy! Michael Huntington, thanks for being here, man. Well, thank you. It's great to talk with you. I love your show. I've been listening to it, and uh, I think it's one of the better ones out there, so thanks for having me. Oh, man, you don't have to say that, but thank you so much. <laughs> I, I don't have to say it, but no, it's... Uh... You know, there's there's a lot of podcasts out there now, especially in this arena, and you know, striving towards the professionalism aspect, I think, is a, a big thing, and having an intelligent conversations, I think, is a big a big thing as well. So, uh, kudos to you. <laughs> well, thanks, man. I don't know how intelligent my conversations have been, but I appreciate <laughs> the kind words. I've been following you for a little while now. You have a a blog online called Huntington Strange Travels. But I think the the thing I follow the most is your Instagram account, which you post a lot of great photos on. But before we get into all of that, I want to go back to, you know, where this started for you. You know, this strange traveling, this interest in the paranormal. Did it start in your youth? Did it start as an adult? I'm always curious how people get on this path. Well, uh I guess like a lot of people, you know, uh, you grow up hearing a lot of the stories and, and being uh, being part of the culture. You know, you uh, you may have watched a movie or a TV show growing up, and it, it sort of captivated you. Uh, I grew up in the 70s. I'm a little, I'm a little bit older than yourself, but, but uh, the culture that I grew up in back then was pervasive with, with UFOs and, and Bigfoot and ghost stories, you know, I mean, uh, you had your ancient astronauts and you had your, your Bigfoot, uh, uh, documentaries or cheesy, uh, sun chick, sun classic, uh, documentaries. And, you know, you had the exorcist, which was uh, big at the theaters back then. Uh, and of course, you know, your, your close encounters and all that stuff. So it was, it was pretty much pervasive in the culture. I grew up with it. I grew up uh, with, a family that was sort of open to those sort of things. Uh, my mom was an avid uh, tabloid reader, so she got all of the Weekly World News and the National Enquirer and all those uh, every week. And uh, she handed them off to me to clip them up and put them into files, you know, after uh, she was done with them. So even when I was like four or five years old, I was reading about uh, about this sort of stuff and and doing clippings and, and, and sort of collecting uh, stories and, and, and looking at uh, all these different mysteries. It just made the world more interesting and mysterious. And uh, as I got to be an adult and then got married and had, had kids, I wanted to uh, do the same sort of thing uh, with my boys. So uh, we've taken it upon ourselves the past few years to travel around to a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting uh, places, uh, UFO landing spots or encounter spots and places where people have seen Bigfoot and haunted houses as we, uh, as we take our family vacations. So, uh, I think it's good to, uh, to, to maintain that mystery and, and get the kids interested in these sort of things. So it's, uh, sort of come full circle with me and I'm also a researcher, you know, so I, I, I find all these stories and, and these accounts uh, fascinating and visiting the sites. Is, I, I think one of the best educations to, uh, dig into the background of a lot of these these stories yeah it's quite the unique family vacations that you take here and uh i'm curious you know just to stick with your your youth for a moment was there any specific area of the paranormal that drew you in ghosts ufos or was it just kind of combination of all of it 
Well, it, it it was a combination of all of it, all of it. But I was especially into uh, into UFOs. Uh, Close Encounters sort of did it for me, you know. Uh, it really uh, got my mind going. And uh, when I was younger, I, I had a couple of interesting encounters myself. You know, I did see a, a classic daylight disc, you know, silvery flying saucer uh, flying through the air. So that that sort of locked me into uh, wanting to wanting to look at, at at that mystery, especially. We moved around a lot when I was a kid, so you know I, I was always the new kid at at, at a new school, and uh, I, I would gravitate towards uh, you know the paranormal section in the uh, in the library because you know that's actually the very first section, you know point zero zero one. So it's a good I could always find that <laughs> in any library that I went to. So I would. I, I love the subjects. Uh, UFOs was my big thing, and it still is my my big focus. Back in the late seventies, I actually uh, was a a member of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, uh, also known as APRO, and I was one of their their young. They're not around anymore, but uh, it was a very influential group. It was on par with MUFON and and some of the other NICAP and some of the other groups of the period. And uh, I was a member back then and uh, I, I got all the newsletters and bought their uh, symposium papers and was reading those when I was, you know, eight or nine years old. So uh, I consider myself sort of a veteran researcher when it, when it comes to that, I've always been into, uh, into it. Wow. I, you know, when I walked into the library, when I was a kid, I was, going straight for like the Hardy Boys and things like Goosebumps. Was that series around when you were a kid? Uh no, that that's uh I was pretty much an adult when the, the Goosebumps stuff came about, but uh, I I did get the Hardy Boys uh mysteries uh if not just to look at the covers, you know, the covers were 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 fascinating. And and there was a Hardy Hardy Boys uh TV show back in the 70s as well. It was it was a precursor to the X Files, uh, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, was also uh, a popular series back then that I that I watched religiously. Uh, that went on to uh, influence uh, the X Files. So uh, yeah, I was I was digging those as well. You know, one of my great memories from my childhood is going to our school library with with my class, and every so often we would play this this trivia game. And the questions would be essentially the same, but like span over the course of several classes. Like you would maybe go through 15 questions in one class and 15 the next and 15 the next. But at some point they ran out and just restarted the questions. And this question about the Hardy Boys would come up every, you know, so many times. And it was just, who was the author of it? And I was the only one in the class that knew it was Franklin W. (laughs) Dixon. And I was so proud of that. And I got that question right for my team every time. And I, I still, I mean, obviously I still know who wrote it, but it's just one of those things that, this one of those little nuggets of memory that sticks with you forever, you know, that you just really enjoyed something in your youth and it's just never left your mind. So it's nice to meet right. a fellow a fellow Hardy Boys fan. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and, and, and I, I kind of, uh, well, deliberately, uh, I, I kind of uh, model my boys after that. You know, they're... They're uh, six and seven, or five and uh, seven here now, and uh, you know they've they've been to a lot of a lot of famous weird locations. So I'm I'm sort of uh, playing them up as sort of modern Hardy Boys <laughs> because they've actually been to some of these interesting places. Uh, but you know it's it's bucket list sort of thing, sort of stuff for me, and 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 things that I would have liked to have done. You know, when I was a kid, I mean, I'm sure you would have liked to have uh, gone to some of these interesting places when you were a boy, you know, while you're reading Hardy Boys, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I credit stories like that for, you know, this sort of investigative, curious personality that I have now. It really started back when I was a kid and it just never left, which I think is important, you know, to, to not lose that childlike curiosity about the world you live in. Yeah, and, and you don't want your kids to grow up to be, you know weirdos or, or you know too far out there but uh if it, if it can get them asking the right questions you know uh skeptical questions as well you know I, I i propose to my kids you know to offer different alternative theories to to different things you know like mothman or ufos or the Loch Ness monster and they're ready to offer all kinds of different theories you know some of them uh you know pretty uh 
pretty skeptical ones, which, you know, it was good to do. Yeah, but overall, all of this is, you know, it's to get the creative mind going and to uh, to instill, you know, interest in 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 the world and, and in science as well. You know, I, I, we go to a lot of aviation and space uh, locations and and uh, museums, you know, and roadside attractions, historical places, as well as uh, some of our paranormal journeys. Right. But, you know, you mentioned just very briefly that you had a UFO encounter of your own. Do you mind sharing that story? Well, uh, I guess it was like uh, like the summer of 1979, I believe, uh, sometime in June. I, I forget what the date was. Uh, you would think that being into into the, the subject that I would have the date down, but it was I guess I was sort of in a daze after it happened. But uh, we were coming back. It was in St. Louis, and we were coming back from, uh, I guess, like a business picnic. My my dad was uh, was a salesman, and uh, there was a corporate picnic at, uh, I guess, the CEO's house. And uh, we were coming back from that and driving along and, uh, you know, look out the window and uh, totally unexpected. I see, a, you know, a golden reflecting the sun metallic, uh, you know, classic flying saucer, two inverted discs, uh you know, with a line segmenting the middle of it and uh, probably saw it just for a few seconds, but <laughs> I was ecstatic and sort of, uh, sort of blown away that after having been in the, in, into the subject and interested in it, that, I, you know, I eventually uh, did have, you know, an encounter. I did have an encounter later on in life as well, just a couple, a couple years back, you know, I saw a classic triangular, black triangular object cross in front of the in front of the full moon. Now I, I attribute that to probably some kind of uh, military aircraft, but it was unlit and uh, totally silent, but it was probably something that we have in secret, uh, you know, maybe the Manta or something that that's still out there. I am in Missouri. Uh, I'm in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And uh, here in Missouri, we do have Whiteman Air Force Base where a lot of the stealth, I think all of the stealth bombers actually are housed or are based, the active ones. So, you know, there there could be some uh, active secret craft flying uh, around in this area. So I'm open to that possibility. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned you're in Cape Girardeau. There's an interesting story in Cape Girardeau from years ago, but I want to preface it because when I first started, well, I think when anybody first starts researching UFOs, they start with Roswell or maybe something like Rendlesham in the UK, but... I think here it's mostly Roswell that you're introduced to, but then you realize when you get further down that rabbit hole that Roswell wasn't even the first UFO crash site in the U.S. It's just, it's the most famous probably, but it wasn't the mm-hmm. first. And where you live in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, actually has a case that predates Roswell by a few years, right? Yes, and uh, that's not to say that it necessarily was the first. Uh, you know, there may have been may have been others that we haven't discovered yet, but. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of research in the in the in the past decade or so, especially that has looked into different folklore and different stories that have alluded to uh, a similar event happening here in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Uh, Cape Girardeau's on the river, the Mississippi River, located in the uh, southeastern portion of the state of Missouri, and uh, the area is called the Boot Heel because you know it's got that little notch there at the bottom and uh, I guess going back uh, probably to the 80s now, there have been sort of these rumors uh, that have come on the heels of interest in Roswell that uh, something very similar happened in in Cape Girardeau, that uh, a a disc crashed uh, on a rural farm, and uh, it was discovered, and the military uh, cordoned off the area. Uh, There were... Alien bodies uh, found, uh, three, allegedly, and it was uh, covered up. All the material was gathered up. Uh, everybody was sworn to secrecy, and uh, you know, it went on to be folklore. Now, uh, uh, people have come forward in the past in the past few years, so you know, we're, we're, we're building some of the credible cases. It, it, this was in April of 1941, so this did predate Roswell by a number of years. It, it was actually prior to the beginning of uh, the Second World War. So, uh, you know, it, it, if it did happen, it definitely uh, definitely has uh, the Roswell template if it did happen. Uh, and, and maybe it happened elsewhere. I think most accounts are 
are very similar in in, re, in respects to you know the same thing happening. So, have you been to that site? Yeah, there's uh, there there's a couple of locations uh, that are possibilities. Uh, we we sort of know the general area. There's uh, a few researchers in, in in this area. Paul Blake Smith uh, wrote uh, Mo Forty One, the bombshell before Roswell. That he he was. Uh, he's a Cape Girardeau native. He lives in Springfield now, but uh, he actually uh, has done quite a bit of the research uh, into the area. We haven't really pinpointed exactly where the crash was, but we do know the general location and and most likely which farm or two that it, that it was on. I, I have been to a couple of the possible locations. Hopefully, uh, we can uh, you know get the correct uh, permissions uh, to uh, do further investigations and, and maybe uh, look on the ground to see if we can uh, find any materials. Uh, that that's something that uh, may be coming down the line here in the, in the next year or so. You know, I find it curious that there's an Air Force base where you're at. There's also uh, an Air Force base near Roswell. So, do you think there's a connection here? Maybe. Well, the uh, the Air Force uh, facility that was uh, in the area at the time is no longer in operation. It's closed down. Uh, it, it was uh, the uh, Sykeston Airfield, which is a, a few miles south of, of the uh, alleged crash site, uh, was a training facility uh, for uh, for pilots uh, prior to the war and, and during the war. It's not in operation anymore, but... The hangars are still there, and uh, quite possibly some of the material from the crash might have might have been in one of those hangars before it was uh, shipped off to Wright Patterson. I guess I was getting at it more from the angle that you know back in '41 when it was operational, and then in '47 when Roswell's was operational. Is it a coincidence that there are that there are UFO crash sites near these Air Force bases back then? Mm, I don't know. It's uh, either going to be uh, it was some sort of you know, military aircraft that was being tested, or it's uh, you know craft from elsewhere that is uh, interested in in our facilities. You know, so yeah, it's uh, it's intriguing. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's intriguing. Personally, I I fall into either one of two camps, and I'm not I'm not sure which one. I'm I can go either way, but you know, the man-made crafts that are piloted by humans, you know, military aircraft that that seems to be plausible. But then I go on to a whole other level with this, you know, this kind of new physics approach to it with this interdimensional hypothesis that you've heard about. I guess it's not a new hypothesis, but it's sort of gaining steam in the community, isn't it? Yeah, the uh, interdimensional hypothesis or, you know, ultra terrestrial hypothesis, however you want to term it, was sort of floated out there uh, back in the 70s. Uh, Jacques Vallée, uh, I think, postulated that, that there may be some sort of interdimensional connection to uh, to the phenomena that we're seeing. Yeah, I, I, I'm more inclined to to that theory, to that notion, more so than, you know, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, mostly for, for the sort of things that you just said, that, you know, our physics is now catching up to the idea that uh, there could be multiple dimensions and, and uh, you know ways to, to traverse uh, you know through through the different layers of reality which you know it it could be a possibility time travel is also you know a possibility you know beings from from different times maybe that's why they look different maybe that's why their ships are or look different you know but I try to avoid you know lumping the entire phenomenon into into one basket I think what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a lot of different phenomena, and I, I prefer to look at each case individually because some cases are stronger than others. Some some cases are you know outright, outright baloney, and some of them uh, are actually really intriguing anomalous phenomena that that is worthy of scientific investigation. I think most cases are mistaken interpretations of. of of things you know identified flying objects you know people are look, looking in the sky and they're seeing atmospheric phenomena or astronomical phenomena or misidentified airplanes or aircraft a portion of those which i think are, are going to be uh, secret military aircraft that have not been revealed it's certainly a lot of stuff that we have flown over the years uh, has been you know viewed as being unidentified and then we look back in retrospect and we see 
you know, oh, yeah, that's that's what they were seeing. They were seeing the stealth bomber or stealth fighter. I think in, a, in, in the coming decades, we'll see that we have had things like stealth dirigibles and and space vehicles that that we've been using and in secret things that go really fast i think we probably have some kind of invisibility that we have been using on on some of our our craft but you know then after you go through uh, all the different mundane explanations there there's a small percentage that are truly anomalous and and worthy of, of investigation because and that's the purpose of science it's to uh, to try to find out what what the mysterious unexplained things are now if it, the the problem is getting a handle on something that is moving around you know the the big trick is is trying to find areas where the phenomena is localized so that it can be measured and tested and and theories can be postulated to try to determine you know what something actually is i i, I think there is a lot of unknowns that relate to atmospheric phenomena geological Phenomena. I, I, I think there is probably some sort of earth light, some sort of uh, uh, buoyant plasma that is natural that can account for a, a certain number of the uh, truly uh, unusual cases. But you know, as even then, as we whittle things down, there's uh, there's uh, there's a few that are that almost defy explanation. You get to the really high strange stuff where people are seeing metallic craft and alien beings, and uh, they're interacting with them. Am I open to those possibilities? Yes. Uh, it's harder to, to get the evidence, though. You know, U- ultimately everything's got to come down to getting uh, evidence that we can persuade science with. Uh, yeah, it's got to get past. Yeah, it's got to get past the belief system. You know, uh, anecdotal accounts are, are are not really what science is about. We got to get down to to the actual nuts and bo- bolts and and find out what the cause of these things are. Well, you mentioned Jacques Vallée a few minutes ago. I really like, you know, his multidimensional hypothesis and the way that he explored what these different sorts of psychic phenomena had in common with each other. And mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm wondering, as as someone who has traveled to a lot of different sites of UFO crashes, haunted houses, cryptid locations, I'm wondering if you have seen or heard or felt any sort of commonality from your travels to these sites? Well, um, there are definitely locations that are, are centers of uh, multiple phenomena. There are places that have UFO accounts, Bigfoot accounts, uh, you know, cryptid accounts, ghosts, you know, uh, all in, in, in one area. Of course, you, you, have, you have to be wary of uh, you know the community that is that is uh, putting forth these stories you know some some towns or some cities may may be prone to uh, you know a, a healthy folklore but i think if you do you know the research i th- i think that you will find that uh, there are localities where there's a lot of strange things that are going on and I, and i have been in places like like point pleasant uh, you know where the Mothman encounters occurred, which you know also a lot of other strange things happen there as well. You know a lot of UFO encounters happen there, and and it it does have sort of a weird vibe. You know, of course vibes are subjective, but just the the number of of strange things happening in one area kind of makes you want want to take a look and, and and see if there's something that is connecting them. Whether it's you know some sort of interdimensional type thing or some sort of psychic thing, you know it's definitely worthy of, of looking at. I, I, I've also been to uh, the Marley Woods, which is another hotspot area. It's uh, here in south south central Missouri, and uh, that place has it's called Missouri Skinwalker Ranch, and it has you know cattle mutilations and UFOs and Bigfoot creatures and and orbs and all sorts of things going on there. What can explain it? I don't know. It could be something natural, or it could be something, uh, you know, unnatural. I've been to some places that are that are creepy. Usually, the haunted houses tend to be the creepiest. Now, whether or not it's actually something is is, is being triggered inside of myself, or if it's you know a psychological thing, that's that's hard to determine. Well, I'm curious about the Marley Woods cases that you that you just mentioned. I've heard of this location. 
from what I know, it's. I think you said it just now too. It's it's secret. Like nobody really knows where it is. Well, it's it, it's it's a secret, but it's also you know sort of an open secret. People kind of know generally where it's at. Uh, uh, it was an area that was investigated by uh, Ted Phillips, who was one of the premier uh, UFO investigators. He investigated all the uh, all the top cases. Uh, probably the greatest trace evidence investigator ever. But his his stopping grounds. He's still around, but he's, he hasn't really been active uh, too much. But uh, he he investigated uh, the Marley Woods. Uh, it, it's not really even called the Marley Woods. It's, it's a name that he came up with uh, to protect the anonymity of the, the rural area where a lot of these accounts are, uh, are, are coming from. And uh, so people, out of respect, still sort of maintain it, you know, in secrecy because you don't want a lot of people – traversing through uh, people's yards to try to see stuff but yeah that, that's a hot spot that's uh it, there were field investigations uh first part of the uh, of the new century that looked at uh, some of the strange going ons and and there was quite a bit of evidence uh, gathered missouri so, uh, southeast missouri also is known for uh, for the piedmont sightings back in 73 uh where the actual uh, you know the, the the first real scientific investigation of uh, of UFOs took place with Project Identification, which was conducted by uh, Southeast Missouri State University and Professor Harley Rutledge. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of weird uh, areas to look at in my neck of the woods here. Yeah, sounds like it, man. I didn't know that Missouri was that much of a hot spot for paranormal activity. Yeah, but go figure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious about cryptid locations. This is something that uh, personally I've I've never really researched cryptids much. They've never really interested me. Mm-hmm. I had an interesting cryptid-like story that I might share with you in a few minutes. But before I do that, what sort of cryptid locations have you been to, and what do you make of the phenomena in general? It's like I said, it's never really interested me. As I've said, uh, Cape Girardeau, we're here on the uh, on the Mississippi River, and just across. Across the river is southern Illinois, and southern Illinois seems to be, you know, traditionally and historically, you know, a hot spot for uh, for a lot of strange creatures, and that's what cryptids are. You know, they're just sort of unknown creatures that that people uh, people have reported over the decades. Uh, Lauren Coleman, the the famed cryptid researcher, you know, the the father of cryptozoology, so to speak, you know, he's the one that came up with all these terms. Is is from uh, southern Illinois. So uh, a lot of the stories that come out of Southern Illinois were were investigated by by him. A lot of them uh, coming out of the, uh, the the early 70s. It seems like 1973 was sort of a weird time all throughout the country. You know the the, the Piedmont UFOs uh, that I mentioned, and uh, you know cryptid creatures. Uh, all that stuff sort of took place in the in this one year. And if you, if you go back and look at it, it's I think it's probably one of the strangest years in, in American history. But Lauren Coleman investigated some strange creatures. A few of the places that I've been to have been uh, Murfreesboro Mud Monster, which is sort of a, an albino Bigfoot that was seen back in uh, 1973. I've been to uh, pretty much all of those sighting locations. The, the town of Murfreesboro has embraced their Mud Monster, and they actually have a beer festival every year <laughs> at uh that's cool. At, at their yeah, at their local park, you know where where most of the sightings took place. So, you know, you go over there in October, you'll see uh, people drinking beer and dressed up like Bigfoot, which is kind of a <laughs> kind of a strange thing. Also, not too far from here was the uh, the Enfield Horror. Oh yeah, which was which was a a three legged creature that that was also invested investigated by Lauren Coleman. And that was some sort of weird monster. With three legs and wasn't that like a poltergeist case? Uh, no, uh, there, there's the Enfield haunting, which was in England. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Place, oh yeah, yeah. yeah no, back I, in I the seventies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's easy to yeah, it's easy to uh, confuse the two and and yeah. So uh, uh, no, the Enfield Illinois horror was was a cryptid creature. Uh, although the Enfield uh, haunting uh, in England was also. <laughs> spooky another spooky story with that that was a pol- that was a probably one of the most famous poltergeist cases i think yeah that's worth looking at too I'd, I'd love to go over there and visit 
<laughs> that location. You know, if I ever make it over to England, uh, might have to go by that. Uh, I don't that know house. if I'd want to go in there, man. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I've been to some of the most haunted places in, in, you know, in the country now, and uh, I haven't really had any, any weird encounters, you know. I mean, I, I, I did take ill in January after I, you know, visited the Exorcist house and the Lemp Mansion and the McPike Mansion, uh, all within like a one day period. You know, three of the most haunted places. Wow. Yeah. Around and <laughs> and within a week, I was actually hospitalized. You know, some people have said, you know, you can't visit too many evil places at once, you know. It's, uh, I don't necessarily attribute that to... Oh, you know what, man? I saw you post on Facebook that you were having some health problems back then. Is So that was right after yeah. visiting those sites. Wow, that's that was crazy. a week after visiting what what's called the, uh, the Real Exorcist House in St. Louis. But, uh, yeah, and, and the Lent Mansion in St. Louis and, uh, and the McPike Mansion in, in Alton, Illinois. And yeah, within a week, I was uh, I was in the hospital. <laughs> Is there any place you've been then that you wouldn't go back to, just based on the feeling you got there? I mean, was have you ever been legitimately scared while you were at some of these places? No, not really. I mean, I, I've I've been some of these places at you know at dark by myself. Uh, I, I try not to bring the kids to uh, you know to spooky haunted places. You know, I definitely don't take them out anywhere at night. But no, I. Uh, now I guess you know some people said it, I, I'm gonna have it coming to me. <laughs> well, I, I do take that back. The, the one place that I did go to that was just had a creepy factor, and I probably would not go into by myself at night would probably be Bobby Mackey's haunted music hall out there, uh, Covington, Kentucky area. Well, that's not too far from where I live, but I'm not really sure yeah. what that is. What is that? Bobby Mackey's, uh, it's uh, considered one of the most haunted places in the country. <laughs> it's uh, They call it the the gate to hell. <laughs> oh, now I'm interested. Uh, and, yeah, that's... yeah, and and all of the uh, all of the uh, popular ghost hunting programs have, have been there, and those guys say that they would not go back. You know, so that kind of gives you an idea. It it was definitely kind of, I don't know. It's I, I tend to be scientific and I tend to be skeptical about a lot of things, you know. But yeah, that place just sort of, sort of just had a weird, unsettling aspect to it. What actually happened there? From what I recollect, it was a slaughterhouse, maybe 150 years ago, and then uh, it became, uh, I guess, like a speakeasy and sort of a rowdy, you know, music hall after that, and. I guess like any place uh, that sort of clientele, you're going to have, you know, gangsters killing people and, uh, you know, some murders. I, I, I think there's was, there was a well there where they where, uh, people contend that there were bodies uh, placed down into. So people that worked at the, uh, the music hall and, you know, just for one reason or another decided they didn't want to leave, you know. Right. Like any other, any other ghost story. But uh, that sort of goes beyond a lot of other haunted places in that people claim that there's like actual demons in that place that there's there's actually it's a, a, a porthole you know a portal or a gate to hell there so uh, that might uh, kick it up a notch but it's it, it is considered one of the uh, one of the most haunted places in the country did you know how many gates to hell there are like reported to be there's like it seems like there's one in every state almost that's what's uh, you know sort of interesting that we found in our in our travels that you can pretty much go anywhere in the country and and when we set on out on trips you know it's not I'm gonna drag my kids out to a haunted location or a UFO field where a UFO went we're usually going on vacation to somewhere else and then we'll see what we can find along the way and pretty much between point A and point B you're gonna find in, in all these little towns that they're gonna have a haunted lover's lane or they're going to have some sort of cryptid encounter. Every town has a haunted house. I don't care where you go. And, it, you know, at least a few people in every, every town or every farm is that you, that you pass have, have, you know, seen a UFO or something else weird or bizarre. So yeah, you, you're, you're right. There, there are gates of hell, you know, as people call them uh, everywhere. There's also spook light roads everywhere. And, uh, you know, haunted cemeteries pretty much everywhere, and uh, that's what we like to do. We like to 
travel along and see which ones uh, you know hold the mystery. A lot of this is folklore and urban legend. Sure. You know, but just being able to document that, you know, before it, it disappears, I, I think is good. And, and being able to encourage communities to celebrate, you know, their unique uh, folklore, I, I think is beneficial, regardless of the reality of, you know, whatever the circumstances are. But there's also always that possibility. That's what makes it interesting. And, in, you know, is that, is that the, the mystery is a possibility, you know, maybe there was a Bigfoot creature standing here, or maybe there was something from another world or another dimension that landed in a craft, you know, right, right at this yeah. location. You know, one of the first gates to hell, and I'm using air quotes around that, but one of the first gates to hell that I remember reading about when I was younger was in Stull, Kansas. Have you heard of that? S-T- no. S-T-U-L-L, Kansas. This is, dude, when we get off this call, Google that. Okay. And read up about it. It's it's an interesting story. It probably falls into the folklore category, but man, it's uh there's a church and a cemetery there, and I think the cemetery the church sits on the grounds of the cemetery or something, and the cemetery itself is this supposed gate to hell, and people have been going there for years, like especially like in the Halloween season, obviously, and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the, I can't recount any of the stories, but it's pretty crazy. I mean, it's the first thing I think I stumbled upon that when I was a teenager and just kind of blew my mind. That was my <laughs> original gate to hell, but since then, I like I said, I, I think I've found one in about every state. But yeah. I wanted to circle back to, to the cryptids real quick because I, I wanted to share an experience that I had real quick. Mm-hmm. I went to Mexico several years ago and was fishing on the beach, and <laughs> down the way on the beach... There was this animal creature that that came out of the water, and the guy mm-hmm. that I was with, we saw it, and you know from a distance it looked mangy and just kind of scary, you know. And it was dark; it was or it was getting dark out. And the first thing we thought was, "Oh shit, that's a chupacabra!" <laughs> and we we got the hell out of there. Now, in hindsight, it probably wasn't. It's was probably a coyote or a, a dog or a wolf or something. I don't know if wolves are in Mexico, but probably not a chupacabra we were hoping that it was we were talking about it at our campsite like all night we were like oh we just saw a chupacabra also had a few cervezas so you know that probably influenced (laughs) us a little bit but i'm curious if you've ever had any personal cryptid experiences or know of anybody who have i have met quite a few uh squatchers you know and bigfoot hunters so uh that whole crowd uh you know has had encounters uh i did have something looking through my grandfather's rural farm window when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, in a farm, uh, Johnny Carson would come on and you have to go, you know, turn the TV off and go to bed and cause you had to get up and do chores early in the morning. So, uh, went into the living room to, uh, to turn off the TV and there was a window next to the television and th- this window is, about six feet off the ground on the outside, so uh, you know it wasn't wasn't really close to the to the ground. I, and I looked, and there were two yellow glowing eyes on a a black face, you know, that was kind of pointed at the top. And it was looking in, and I froze and and backed up, and it ducked down. Called my grandfather, and he went and got his shotgun and went out to look and see what it was. Uh, so he, he saw that I was frightened enough to. Uh, to where he went and got a gun, you know, so he knew that I wasn't pulling his leg. Uh, now, what it could have been, I don't know. Could it have been a bear? Well, I, uh, that bear was, you know, way up there, and it must have been a big one if that's the case. I, I was only a couple of feet away. It certainly did not look, you know, like a bear, just just by the way that the head was shaped. It, it Very, you know, black, dark feature, features, and the eyes seemed to glow. You know, it was, it was more than a... A reflection it was like a glowing sort of yellow you know set of eyes i i couldn't tell you what it was it's it's an unknown creature and i just chalk it up to that uh, that's probably the the closest thing that i've had to uh, any sort of cryptid aside from my fake chupacabra i've never really experienced anything like that but like i said i've never really been interested in it i've never found bigfoot or things like bigfoot i guess to be of particular interest but that mm. community is just, they're damn near psychotic about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, 
we uh, attended the uh, the Mothman Festival uh, last September. There was a lot of Bigfoot people there, and and you can pretty much tell who they are because they're usually uh, wearing camouflage. They have a lot of facial <laughs> hair, and they and they have you know some sort of walking stick with them. I think it's uh, sort of the the uniform, but you know that's that's people that spend a lot of time in the woods. You know they're out there they're out there looking and they're out there hiking and hunting and you know looking for uh, looking for a creature that they believe exists and and that they believe that they have seen and interact with and have evidence uh, of and for and i think probably out of all of the uh, the different paranormal fields i think there's probably actually there's probably more evidence for you know a bigfoot than there is for for some of the other paranormal stuff you know it's you know we don't have ghosts in a bottle or you know really verified pieces of flying saucers but there are some interesting, uh, you know, hair samples and and you know tracks that uh, that the, the Bigfoot people have been able to document, and that is sort of in, intriguing. There's a lot of woods out there. There's still a lot of places to hide. Not everywhere is, has been urbanized. So uh, that's true. Yeah, I open I, I I keep that possibility open. Now you do have a lot of camps within uh, you know all these different research groups. You know, there are Bigfoot people that believe in the supernatural aspect you know there's ghost squatchers and there's some uh, that believe that bigfoot is interdimensional uh or maybe you know an extraterrestrial being and you can you can get fights <laughs> and you know physical at least at least verbal fights uh, almost to the point of physical in, in disagreement as to you know what the reality is uh especially within cryptids as far as cryptic community as far as what you know a bigfoot is <laughs> well you <laughs> know is, Cryptids being interdimensional fit, I believe, with Jacques Vallée's theory, which we touched on earlier. Just the fact that mm. all of these sorts of phenomena could just have something in common. Who knows what it is? But mm. yeah, I I don't see why that would be in the Bigfoot community sort of shunned. It's it's as yeah. valid as it being a real physical animal like creature. Yeah, it's uh it, now Valet did you know postulate uh, the possibility of different dimensions, but I think he uh, has also uh, attributed a lot of these ph- phenomena to you know a, a psychic aspect, right? Uh, which is a little harder to to pin down. You know, are we creating a reality through you know our, our psychic will, or or you know are we manifesting things with with our human mind? You know, sort of like the creatures from the id. That's a little harder to to comprehend, you know, that's where you, you get into the metaphysics, but I guess it comes down to what your notion of reality is, you know, the mind and the, and physics might be a little more intertwined than we, than we realize that, you know, maybe all these things are connected together and, and maybe there is, uh, you know, a psychic component. Maybe we are manifesting things, so to speak. Well, it could be, I mean, I, I, I was into UFOs and then I saw a UFO you know, I saw a, a, a classic flying saucer. I, I saw a flying saucer. I, did I manifest it? Was I psychologically deluding myself or was it an actual physical thing that was there that just coincidentally, uh, you know, coincided with my my belief system? You know, all these are interesting questions that we need to look at. I don't discount the mind creating reality hypothesis. That's the observer effect, I believe, in physics. And then Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum physics, I think, is about the same thing, too. You know, just if I'm looking for something, I'm probably going to find it. You know what I mean? So you mentioned going to the real exorcist house in St. Louis. Now, you live near St. Louis, right? Is that the first time you've been there? That is the first time uh, that I've been there. I, I'm actually from St. Louis, uh, but I I never made it up there. Uh, when I was a kid, and when the, uh, the the exorcism stuff was going on, uh, my parents did take me to one of the exorcist locations where the actual uh, supposedly the the actual exorcist took place was, or at least part of the exorcism uh, took place at what was called the Lexington Brothers Hospital, which was a, a facility in St. Louis that's no longer there. But when I was a kid, we went by there and we actually saw like boarded up 
room supposedly where uh, the actual exorcism <laughs> took place. And yeah, that had a profound impact upon me when I was a kid. Parents pointing up and saying, you know, that's where the exorcist took place, you know. No, but I, I, I'd never made it to what is called the uh, the real exorcist house, which is a, a home in Del Nor. Uh, area in St. Louis. It's kind of a, a gated su- subdivision there. The real exorcist story took place uh, back in the 40s, um, and, and it was a boy. And there were some manifestations that took place at that location, and, and it was one of the reasons the Je- Jesuits got involved and actually looked at it uh, uh, as a serious case. Yeah, I, I, I think some of the ghost hunting shows have actually uh, gone deeper and gone inside of there. I, I didn't get to make it inside. I, I went by and uh, looked at it from the outside. Uh, there are people living in there, which uh, I think is really interesting. You know, what, what would it be like to live? Yeah, that would be, yeah. Just to pick their brains yeah. for 10 minutes, be like, hey, like, Seriously, yeah. what, what's your problem here, guys? Yeah, it's like you, you hear like uh, you know the Amityville Horror House was for sale recently, you know, and it's like Who's you know I would, that. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean I, I would I wouldn't mind visiting. I, I wouldn't mind going around. I, I would wouldn't want to be by myself just because you know I saw that movie <laughs> when I was a kid and I don't right. want you know flies and blood and all that stuff. All you know because you know it, there's always that in the back of your mind. Uh, with with all of these uh, paranormal things, that there's got to be that one time where reality is just going to say, "Hey," <laughs> and then you're going to get bloody walls and you know a, a ghost smacking you in the face. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe some people are, are are okay with that. Maybe that's why I haven't seen anything is because you know maybe I couldn't take it. I, I've been in a haunted places where supposedly a ghost has walked behind me, like. Sitting at a table, a group of people look behind me all at the same time, and I just missed it. <laughs> you know, they all saw it. They obviously all saw it. They say that I can't see it because I, I'm, you know, not a believer. Uh, so, well, that goes back to what we were just talking about, where you know your right. mind, your mind creates your reality, and if you don't believe in ghosts, then you'll probably never see one. And if you right. don't believe, if you don't know anything about the Amityville horror. You don't know that house is haunted, so you may be just fine in there. Right. But also, then again, you know, maybe a voice will tell you to get out. <laughs> well, yeah, that, there's that <laughs> and, possibility. And, and, yeah, there's always that possibility. I, and, and I guess on some level, you know, I'm looking for that. Yeah, I, like I, I've been to haunted places. I, we, we went to uh, Eureka Springs last year where the uh, there's a haunted hotel there. The, the Crescent Hotel is considered one of the most haunted and, uh, you know, Went on the ghost tour, looked around all over, all over the place at night, took pictures, took videos, did the whole, you know, ghost hunting thing, and uh, didn't experience anything, but, uh, you know, I had stuff show up on camera. Same thing with Marley Woods. Uh, you know, I went to Marley Woods to document the, the location and didn't see anything, but there were some interesting things that showed up on the camera afterwards, which opens up a whole other group of questions, you know, why didn't I see, you know, what I supposedly photographed? Or is it just some sort of artifact? Yeah. It, it's one thing to have artifacts show up in, in your regular pictures, but, you know, to have artifacts at strange locations that sort of allude to what the strange location is, that's that, that that's very intriguing. And, and I'm hoping as we continue to investigate some of these places and document them that we'll – be able to find more stuff like that. I, it, all of this is soft evidence, though. You know, photographic evidence and, and anecdotal accounts. It, you know, it's it's not going to really push science any. It, it, it's all going to depend on people's belief systems as to whether or not they consider it a reality. But ultimately, I'm a travel writer, and ultimately, I'm visiting unique places to to document them more so than uh, try to prove anything to anybody. I, I do think that these places need to be, uh, the history needs to be known and they need to be celebrated. And, you know, we put it out there as an alternative to uh, a lot of the boring vacation spots that, that, that you can uh, go to. You know, everybody goes to amusement parks, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've been to Myrtle Beach like four <laughs> times, man. Yeah, I yeah. know exactly what you're talking about. But, well, and, there's a lot of places on on the way to Myrtle Beach and a lot of places around Myrtle Beach that are interesting. So. Well, the people that I've traveled with, you know, my mom and dad, uh, they are not really 
into this, so I, I don't really <laughs> think that we'd be able to stop there. But you, you want to stop interest- where? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, we're not going to stop at this cryptid haunting site. <laughs> no, you do have an interesting trip coming up later this summer, though, during the Great American Eclipse, right? Uh, yes. If people out there don't know, that there's going to be a major eclipse that's going to make a swath across the uh, across the country. You know, we're going to have full totality in a lot of areas, a major solar eclipse right, where the moon is going to black out the sun and everything's going to turn not total dark, but kind of a weird purplish color. And it's going to be neat and it's going to be interesting. And, and I, I've seen one of those in my lifetime and, and I'm looking forward to this one, but uh, I'm especially looking forward to it because... On August 21st, the the date of the eclipse, uh, one of the locations for peak totality, meaning it's going to be total eclipse and it's going to also be the long longest duration period, is going to be in Kelly, Kentucky, which is just a couple hours east of, of where I'm at. And the significance of that is that Kelly, Kentucky was the location of a famous uh, UFO alien encounter back in 1955, uh, what was called the famous Kelly Hopkinsville Goblin Encounter, where a, 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 a rural family farm, the Sutton Farm, was, uh, after seeing a UFO, their house was attacked by these silvery creatures for pretty much the whole night. The family shooting shotguns out through the window at the, at the creatures and pretty much just laying siege to these people's uh, home. The eclipse is going to take place on the anniversary of that encounter. Uh, and it's going to take place at <laughs> the location on the same date, which which will be neat. There's a big UFO festival every year. It's called the Kelly Little Green Men Days, but they're gonna they're gonna be a, a, a doing a four day big UFO festival there for that whole weekend leading up to the eclipse, and all the hotels are booked hundreds of miles around, and there's going to be major you know, media there and UFO personalities all over the place. So uh, we're going to go down there and participate and uh, be a part of a of an interesting celestial event that uh, has historical significance as well. So it, it should be fun, and we're, we're going to document that. Yeah, man, I that's going to be a crazy day. I think there's yeah. just, it seems just just there's like a lot that's going to be in play that day. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that stuff going on all, all over this area. You know. Ozzy Osbourne's going to be down here, you know, performing what's called Moonstock. And after after I'm done with Kelly, I got to rush back to Kate because you know here in my my uh, the town that I'm in, Michio Kaku is going to be here. Oh wow! You know, for the eclipse. So I'm going to rush back here and and try to get to talk to him. Uh, so it's it's yeah, it's uh, it's going to be kind of a crazy sort of thing. I encourage everybody. Uh, you know, in the Midwest uh, to research the eclipse and, and try to find a, a good place to, to watch it. Cause it's going to be, it's going to be pretty neat. And I'm looking forward to showing my boys uh, something amazing like that. Absolutely, man. Well, Hey, I think that about does it for us here. Why don't you tell people where they can keep up with the strange travels of Michael Huntington and his family? Okay, well, uh, we are pretty much on all social media and we're expanding out more and more each day. So you can, uh, you know, you can find me on Facebook a lot and on Instagram, uh, Michael Huntington. We're also on Twitter and a couple other things. Uh, I, I do have a WordPress blog uh, that I'm going to be adding some new content to here. Huntington uh, Strange Travels at WordPress, and uh, we're uh, we're working on our uh, our first book. We're we're taking our photographs and and some of our stories and we're collecting them together and we're going to have a, uh, a book coming out hopefully sometime by the end of the summer, I think is what we're looking at now. So it'll be a photo journal and there'll be a lot of interesting stories uh, to go along with the pictures. Absolutely, man. I, I always enjoy seeing your posts on Instagram. Like I said earlier, good luck with the book project, safe travels you. to you and your family. It was great talking to you, man. Okay. Thanks Ryan. Uh, yeah, let's uh, it went by too quick. We're going to have to do this again. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Michael Huntington. Links to his blog and social media profiles are in the show notes if you feel like keeping up with his strange travels. And speaking of strange travels, Michael mentioned that he's trekking to the Kelly Hopkinsville, Kentucky area for the Little Green Men Festival and to view the Great American Eclipse. That, of course, happens on Monday, August 21st. 
I talked about that in a little more detail with astrologer Carmen DeLuccio back in episode 10. Check out that episode for more on the Great American Eclipse in general. Like I said, that's Monday, August 21st. The Little Green Men Festival takes place the entire weekend leading up to that. And I am super excited to share that I... We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hey guys, Ryan Sprague here. When I was 12 years old, I saw something in the sky that I couldn't explain. And I've been searching for answers ever since. And now, I want you to join me on that search. Every Monday for the Somewhere in the Skies podcast. Hear from both researchers and experiencers as we dissect these deeply complex phenomena one mystery at a time. Available now on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, or at somewhereintheskies.com. Remember, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. We now return to your regular programming. Hey, can we figure out how he's doing that? Shit, Sprague. Motherfucker. Anyway, right, so, Great American Eclipse, Monday, August 21st. I will be joining Michael Huntington at the Little Green Men Festival on the day of the eclipse. I may be there at some point over the weekend, too. I'm not too sure of that yet, but the day of the eclipse, Monday, August 21st, I'll be in Kelly, Kentucky. It's the first Oculture road trip, the show's first strange travels, if you will. I have no idea what's going to be happening yet, but you can expect some sort of bonus content from the event, most likely stuff for a YouTube channel, maybe also some bonus audio as well, maybe a full episode. I'm not sure yet still in the planning stages but if you're in that area plan on being in that area let me know i like good food cheap beer making new friends kelly kentucky monday august 21st great american eclipse greatamericaneclipse.com for more information on that event that's linked in the show notes as is information on the little green men festival if you're interested anyway that does it for me in this episode you've been listening to old culture I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Um, okay, well, what we're thinking of as, as aliens are, they're, uh, they're, they're extra-dimensional beings.
please rewind this cassette.